So now let's turn our attention to non-random mating. So remember that for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, for allele frequencies to remain the same from generation to generation, and to have genotype frequencies that can be predicted from the allele frequencies, you need to have random mating. But what if mating is not random? So let's think about some of the ways in which mating can be non-random. We can have inbreeding. So breeding between related individuals is one way that mating can be non-random. We can also have assortative mating. And then sexual selection is a way mating can be non-random, but, but like other forms of selection, sexual selection is going to tend to decrease genetic variation by selecting for particular traits, other traits will be eliminated from the population. So we're not gonna talk about sexual selection in this context. We're gonna focus our efforts predominantly on inbreeding and assortative mating. So again, inbreeding is uh, breeding amongst related individuals. The most extreme form of this is organisms that can self-fertilize, so that can fertilize their own gametes. So there are many examples of this in both the plant and animal world. Self-fertilization is very common amongst plants. Many, many, many of them can do it, but also many species of invertebrates are capable of self-fertilization. Assortative mating is when individuals mate preferentially with a similar phenotype. So they're gonna to tend to be genetically similar to the individuals that they mate with. So neither of these kinds of non-random mating, inbreeding and assortative mating, actually changes the allele frequencies. But both of them are going to skew the genotype frequencies toward more homozygotes and lower heterozygosity. So let's see how that works by looking at this extreme situation of self-fertilization. So again, we're gonna look at one turn of the generations in this population of snails. We're gonna start with these adults that are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. You can see that a quick calculation will show that the allele frequencies of the A1 and A2 allele are both 0.5, and then these numbers are what you would predict based on those allele frequencies of 0.5. This is 1,000 individuals, and 250 of them are a frequency of 0.25, our A1A1, 2PQ, so 2 times 0.5 times 0.5 is going to give you 0.5, and then Q squared, 0.5 squared, again, is going to give you 0.25, so the 250 individuals. So these snails are going to produce gametes, but remember, they're going to fertilize their own gametes. So the A1A1 snails are going to produce only A1A1 offspring, right? That's the only allele those individuals have. They're going to produce eggs and sperm that are all A1, and they're going to combine to produce A1A1 offspring. So if you think back to your Punnett squares, what's going to happen with the A1A2 heterozygotes? They're going to produce A1 homozygotes, heterozygotes, and A2 homozygotes in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. You can do up that Punnett square and very easily convince yourself that this is true. And then again, A2A2 snails are going to produce only A2A2 offspring. So when those gametes self-fertilize and come together and form zygotes, these are the numbers we get. 375 come from the 250 that come from the A1A1 homozygotes. All of those are going to produce A1A1s in the next generation. And one quarter of these 500 heterozygotes. So one fourth of 500 is 125. Add that to the 250. You get the 375 A1A1 homozygotes. Half of these 500 heterozygotes are going to produce more heterozygotes. So you're going to get 250, one half of the 500 heterozygotes. And then again, just like the other, the A1A1 homozygotes, the A2A2 homozygotes are going to be these 250 that are producing only A2A2 homozygotes plus one quarter of your 500 heterozygotes to get in the next population of a thousand snails, 375 of each of the homozygotes and only 250 of the heterozygotes. 
So what's happened? Our allele frequencies have not changed, right? We still have half and half, A1 and A2, right? You can crank the numbers out and convince yourself of that. But we've got more homozygotes. So this is a prediction for 1,000 individuals based on allele frequencies of 0.5. This is, these are the Hardy-Weinberg predictions. Now we've got more homozygotes than we would expect based on Hardy-Weinberg, both kinds of homozygotes, and much fewer. We've got half as many heterozygotes in just one generation of self-fertilization. And we can continue computing this out through more and more turns of the generations and figure out what's going to happen in these generations. So this is the one we just looked at, generation one, where we get 375 of each of the homozygotes and 250. In generation two, this is decreased by half again, so half as many heterozygotes and even more of the homozygotes. In the next generation, it's cut in half again. So what we see is generation by generation with self-fertilization, we get more and more of the homozygotes and fewer and fewer heterozygotes. Basically what we're seeing is a loss of heterozygosity in this population and it happens very, very quickly. So if you're looking at a population and you see these kinds of numbers where you've got a depletion of heterozygotes and an increase over what you would expect so remember, this is the Hardy-Weinberg prediction. Um, this original population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. You've got mo more of both homozygotes. Inbreeding is the likely explanation for that pattern that you see. Remember, I've been saying since the beginning, since we've looked at whether populations are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that the ways in which these populations deviate from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can give you a clue as to what's going on. And this pattern of having more of both homozygotes and fewer heterozygotes is a classic feature of inbred populations. So where do we tend to see highly inbred populations? A lot of times in populations that have shrunk in size so that the only individuals that are available to meet with tend to be close relatives. So extreme population size reductions, population bottlenecks, you tend to get a lot of inbreeding. And one of the effects of this is that many times you've got deleterious recessive alleles that normally can be hidden in heterozygotes, but now you've got a much greater likelihood of these recessive, deleterious recessive alleles being found in homozygotes and actually expressing themselves. So when you have heavily inbred populations, you tend to get a high prevalence of genetic disorders and health problems. Coming back to this idea of diversity, inbreeding has the effect of decreasing heterozygosity, decreasing the number of heterozygotes, and so it causes that part of the genetic variation that's found in heterozygotes to be decreased. So it's a genotype that tends to be missing, even though it doesn't actually affect the allele frequencies directly, it's going to be a force that, that decreases heterozygosity. And again, it can cause very, very serious genetic defects and health problems in highly inbred populations.